Joining me now to discuss the details behind the Russian hacking story is Chief Intelligence Officer of Treadstone 71, Jeff Barden. Jeff, good to see you. Thanks, Vlad. Uh, good to see you as well. So what are our intelligence and cybersecurity agencies currently doing about the threats facing the United States? Is there anything we can do? There's a lot we can do. I think, uh, I think some of the things that we haven't done is force regulation on companies. Is, uh, we've tried to self-regulate our environment for a long time uh, as a former CISO and trying to regulate your, or trying to establish a, a strong program. It's hard to get uh, leadership and organizations to do what needs to be done because they just see it as uh, money that's really not re uh, showing any return. So I think we need to force companies to come to the table to actually implement the type of controls and security embedded in, in systems that really needs to be there. This has been going on for years and years now. Uh, since I've been in this game, uh, it, it really hasn't changed much. We, we're not seeing effective changes in our, in our approaches when it comes to information security. I wonder, and it's interesting that you say that, that um, this has been going on for years. I, I'm assuming we're talking about the, the hacking, but propaganda wars have existed since biblical times, right? And if you go back to right. the, in modern history, the United States, for example, dropped leaflets in Korea during the Korean War and during the Vietnam War, obviously during World War II. I mean, and, I, and interestingly enough, I asked the former Secretary of State, James Baker, who was around, obviously, during the collapse of the Soviet Union, if this technology had existed back then, would we have used it to help bring down the Soviet Union? And he said, of course. So I wonder if this is just part of how the game is played. I think it is. I think the uh, the Russian idea of, of Maskarovka, or what they call deception or denial and deception, has been around for a long time. I think what Putin and his and the oligarchs have learned, and largely from the Arab Spring, uh, ISIS's use of the internet, as well as Al Qaeda and Bin Laden's group beforehand, is that the internet is a powerful tool to issue disinformation, denial, deception, uh, to infiltrate different environments, to establish strong media environments that push lies and propaganda, and I think he's invested heavily in this uh, this whole game that is now part of of the new package. I think it's been called uh, ambiguous warfare is what we're calling it now, this whole denial and deception that extends traditional uh, military and physical activities into the cyber world. So certainly we would use it. And I would expect that one of our responses would be to use it in response to actually uh, uh, Putin's activities with respect to these hacks. Right. And there are some who are calling this now a second Cold War. And it's kind of interesting because during the Cold War, which I grew up in, um, we were always afraid that there was going to be, you know, mutually assured destruction, right? That they have nukes and we have nukes and somebody's going to get angry and that's going to be the end of it. Now, it doesn't, it feels like as if the internet is perhaps even, and it's, it's strange to say that the internet is even perhaps even more powerful than nuclear weapons and what it can do to countries and to democracies. I, I agree. I think we've, we've lost sight of, of what you and I went through when we were hiding under our our uh, uh, classroom tables uh, back in the 60s and an atomic war uh, <laughs> training sessions in school that that paranoia stayed with us and I think our collective memories have uh, are gone because a lot of the people today weren't weren't uh, born in that time or didn't grow up in that time and now the internet is out there where we can influence anybody with just a meme with just a few statements people don't look at the evidence they just take it at face value and believe it and then repeat it multiple times. And that's the power of, uh, I think, Putin has tapped into, and I think he fully recognizes it. And we've just forgotten that. You know, if we go back to the Cuban Missile Crisis and back to this whole idea of, of Russian uh, mascarocca uh, and deception, when, the, uh, when this was going on, the Russians or the Soviets at the time issued eight different uh, ships that were loaded with missiles but were uh, disguised to look like agrarian equipment and tractors. They even issued cold weather gear to the, uh, the soldiers who were on these ships. Uh, false bills of lading. The most interesting thing they did that it really relates to kind of what we're seeing here today is actually uh, issued real, actual, uh, true information to Cuban counter-revolutionary groups that were in the United States that the U.S. had already discredited. So when that information came out, it was seen as discredited information. I think this is just an extension of that, and I think we'll continue to see Putin do that as he tries to push populist movements and drive a wedge in 
between Western countries and, and NATO alike. Yeah, and, and you know, I, I'm sure for as a former spy master like yourself, you must find this fascinating, even though at, on one hand it's also a little bit terrifying. But I, you mentioned the Cuban Missile Crisis, and it made me think of the propaganda war that the United States launched against Fidel Castro. Uh, you know, um, uh, you know that that he was sick, and it, there was, I mean, a million, and I, you know, you probably know them better than I do. Um, and against other leaders uh, that uh, we had issues with that were not in strategic alliance with our interests. Um, and so is this the new normal, I guess? Yeah, I think, uh, I think it is. I think it's been very successful in what's been going on. He's invested heavily in, in, uh, in media groups. I think he's even invested in PR organizations that are Western born to, to push out his message. So I believe it is a standard. I think until people realize they need to evaluate what they're looking at to actually demand evidence and think critically to, to coin another meme that you see a lot out there is something we need to do but many people aren't equipped to do that and they take things at face value and we're in the US are, are really uh, looking at things in short term and tactical we're not a long uh, uh, game type of, of country or we're, we're uh, in it for immediate gratification I think that's where uh, the internet and how things media comes across in many cases is that fills fulfills that need and it certainly uh, depends on which side of the fence you're on. I mean, obviously, uh, probably the most famous hacking of all time, at least in modern times, was the Enigma hacking, right? Where we were able, the allies were able to hack into what was considered at the time, in crude measures, unhackable, which was the, uh, the German coding uh, system. And the, the Brits, along with the allies, were able to hack that. Right, that's a great point. Uh the Brits and uh, actually were able to penetrate the Enigma, but they didn't announce it for a long time. Matter of fact, they allowed ships to go down and people to die. Right, at the that's time exactly right, they Chuck, yeah. Release that information. And that's some of the things we're going to face today when we're trying to get the CIA to release information on exactly how they have this high level of confidence that Putin has done it. To do so would give up information as to their assets and their capabilities. So I wouldn't expect to see a whole lot of that come out. It may be uh, discussed at the executive level and maybe the intelligence committees, but uh, we won't see that in, at our level. Fascinating discussion. Jeff Barden, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Vlad.